Hey, Raihan. Hi, Ross. How are you? Uh, not bad. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, so we're here, uh, thanks to the good graces of Blogging Heads, to do a rather experimental Blogging Heads, um, where we, as the co-authors of a new book, um, Grand New Party, How Conservatives Can Win the Working Class and Save the American Dream, um, I'm sorry, How Republicans Can Win the Working Class and Save the American yeah. Dream, uh, that's something I'll probably have to get right, um, <laughs> where we talk about our own book together. Yeah. Um, and basically just how wonderful it is. I thought we could just go on about that for 45 minutes or so. Does that sound good? <laughs> I think that sounds like a brilliant idea. I also wanted to tout uh, Ross's uh, recent book uh, about Jane Goodall. Wait, that's actually not by you, but, but Jane Goodall bears a striking resemblance to you, I think. The same kind of uh, rosy-cheeked English good looks, you know what I mean? I think that uh, same high forehead. I think that this is a good look for you, Ross. It's true. She's actually a distant cousin. <laughs> little are little down fact, the Dowsed Goodall connection. Um, Wait, are you making that up? Yes, I'm making that oh, up. Oh, no, that's so Although, although in a sense, aren't we all, like, you know, with, with with all the new genetic evidence, don't we all have, like, a common ancestor only well, 200 years ago? I'm a direct ago? descendant of, uh, of Genghis Khan, which explains yes. why I'm carrying an enormous scythe and riding on a <laughs> horse. Uh, so, Ross, uh, this book, I mean, uh, what led you to this broad constellation of ideas? Oh wow! Well, that's that's a that's a good initial question. Um, I I I guess it's it's partially. I think people sort of come into American conservatism from a lot of different directions, um, and I came in from a sort of Catholic, pro-life, um, culturally conservative direction, and that that was sort of the bedrock of my conservatism um, in in my teens and into my early twenties while I, while I was at college and so on. And so I think every you know the direction that you come into conservatism from shapes um, it probably shapes your the areas of conservatism that you tend to sort of look more critically at. So I think I, I've always been a little bit more skeptical of the of sort of economic conservatism, for instance, than I have been of social conservatism and, and so forth. And I think that was sort of the bedrock for me in terms of basically looking at the situation the Republican Party is in today and um, trying to think about ways that the Republican Party can get out of the situation it's in today. Hmm, that makes sense. Does it make sense? Yeah, it sure does. Well, I mean, how, how about you? Because I think, well, I mean, one of the interesting things about our book is that, you know, we've, we've written it together, and you and I have sort of coalesced around, you know, a sort of set of, I guess you could call them reform conservative ideas um, about domestic policy. But we, we, do, we come from very different backgrounds, and I don't just mean, you know, in the sense that I am a high-foreheaded cousin of Jane Goodall, <laughs> and you're a, um, well, what, what are you? Uh, my parents are from Bangladesh, uh, but as to what I am, I remember when I was a little kid, I kept claiming to my mother that I was actually from the planet Ekton, which I believe was a variation on the Krypton theme, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I think that my um, political coloration was always very contrarian. I think that um, reading Michael Lind when I was in high school had a big effect on me, and I thought that he just had a really kind of arresting framework for understanding American politics. And though I drifted from that a bit, I think that, you know, I was always... Uh, I tended to be skeptical of the things everyone else around me believed, and because I was in a milieu that... Uh, milieu, I should say, that was very left-wing, I think, you know, I resisted in some ways while thinking of myself as being broadly left of center and then you know late in college thinking that perhaps I was right of center but you know not but having a lot of the same fundamental instincts and orientations I think I became actually a lot friendlier to economic conservatism and particularly to Hayekian ideas concerning the market although I came to it from a kind of weird angle out of a kind of state theory background and out of you know broad interest in the trajectory of intellectual history. Um, you know, I'm, I've never been someone who's reflexively hostile to Marx, for example, though perhaps, you know, very skeptical about Marxists, um, you know, in the contemporary academy. Um, so I think that, you know, at looking at, you know, American conservatism, also because I was very steeped, you know, one of my best friends is an economist, and a lot of my other friends are economists too, and other people who are, you know, in the social sciences and who think of themselves and are very rigorous. So I think that, you know, the criticisms that I had seen of supply-side orthodoxy from that angle um, 
were very persuasive to me a lot of the time. Um, at the same time, the kind of political economy critique of conservatives made a lot of sense to me, particularly a wonderful book by Andre Schleifer called The Grabbing Hand had a big effect on me. Um, and also, I used to be a big foreign policy person, and that was my main thing, and I later gravitated to domestic policy after the September 11th terror attacks. You were, you were the only the only writer in America who, who, who went in that direction. Yeah, I mean, everyone else was like, oh, well, now we have to care about foreign policy. And I was like, uh, well, you know, foreign policy, it seems like a lot of other people care about this. And I also always did care about domestic policy. So um, I think that that was a big part of it and also an intellectual orientation towards, you know, being attracted to – you know, both the idea of a flourishing civil society and also, frankly, the disease of all intellectuals, which is this desire to kind of change and take over institutions and think about how to make them work better, which, um, you know, is why people should be skeptical of me in particular and should try to keep me as w uh, as far away from the levers of power as possible. Uh, but I like to think that I'm kind of aware of these flaws. Uh, you know what I mean? It's like uh, it's a it's a, you know, tough balance to uh, maintain. Well, yeah, I mean, we should probably say at this point, now that we're, you know, five or ten minutes in, what the book is actually about, um, in case in case anyone is confused by this long intellectual digression we've taken. Oh, yeah. But, but, I mean, oh, the, yeah. the, <laughs> that's a good the, idea. The book, I, I mean, um, the book, I, 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 I'll go first, and then you can you can clarify and, and, yeah. and, 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 and challenge me. I, I mean, I think the book is, um, on the one hand, it's, it's sort of a reinterpretation of recent American political history, and by recent, we actually go all the way back to the New Deal, but it's, it's a short book, don't be alarmed. Um, but basically arguing, on the one hand, a little bit against, I think, what is the conventional conservative narrative of, of the past 40 years, which is to say, you know, you have this bright line that runs from Goldwater's small government conservatism to Reagan's small government conservatism, and then the story of conservatism is a story of, you know, trying to just remain faithful to this original vision. And I think we spend a lot of time arguing that actually the modern conservative movement and the Republican Party rose to power on a very specific set of um, of issues, um, and that one of the reasons the Republicans are in trouble now is because they're victims of their own success on those issues, and all of those issues revolved around essentially government failure, um, failure of the liberal leadership class on issues like welfare and crime, uh, foreign policy and taxes. Um, so we're arguing with conservatives. We're also arguing with what I think has become one of the dominant liberal narratives of the past uh, 30 years, which is that, you know, essentially, and uh, this has become to be associated with Thomas Frank's What's the Matter with Kansas, but it goes back a lot further, this idea that uh, essentially conservatism doesn't really have any, either it doesn't really have any content or its content is just, um, you know, it's just a guise for uh, rich, powerful interests that essentially that mobilize working and middle class sentiment um, through you know appeals to symbolic cultural issues to defend um, without existing actually offering them yeah. offering them anything. And I think we spend a lot of time arguing with that view and arguing that again, actually, no modern American conservatism. The, the, the symbolic appeals have been important, but they've always been important because they were rooted in actual policy issues. So thus, you know. Yes, you know the famous. You know there there are these sort of symbolic family values ideas, for instance, that animate a lot of the, a lot of Republican rhetoric. But they're rooted in a very real problem in American society, which is to say the decline of the two parent family. Um, you know, and this and this is true across the board, from welfare to crime to taxes and and so on. So that's the that's the underpinning to the book. And then the second half of the book, um, after we try and lay that groundwork, is concerned with sort of basically domestic policy ideas for conservatives and ways that they can take up the challenges facing working and middle class Americans today in the same way that an earlier generation of conservatives tackled the challenges facing America in the 70s and 80s. So how, what do you think of that as a summary? I think I think that's a very fair characterization. What I think is interesting, and, and I'm a little fixated on this, uh, having um, talked to Corey Robin, who is a really impressive political theorist at Brooklyn College, uh, who has a, you know, a, a characterization of conservatism as basically a long, continuous chain of, uh, you know, kind of reactionary moments uh, directed at protecting existing hierarchies, uh, racial hierarchies, the patriarchy, etc. Um, and you know, I thought it was interesting because I, my own sort of view is of conservatism as having a series of ruptures and being defined by a lot of transpositions, which is to say that, you know, the New Deal, I think that our understanding of it is actually as in some respects, a pretty conservative achievement, uh, a conservative achievement in a way that I think that the you know Goldwater Reagan Republicans would re uh, resist. You know, namely, you have this uh, moment in the 1920s 
of radical cultural change in which, you know, for example, you had a you know, huge influx of women in the workforce, you had in, you know, high levels of urbanization. And one component of the New Deal project, you know, brought to it by uh, the, you know, you know a group of elite women uh, social scientists, the maternalists, was to actually reverse some of these tendencies. They recognized that they couldn't actually recreate the world before the industrial deluge, but they were trying to conceive of ways to actually recreate robust family life in these very different conditions. So it's interesting to me because when you look at a historian like uh, Stephanie Coons talking about, you know, the rhetoric of traditionalism in the family and about how this is largely mythical, she has a point, but again, that actually isn't really responsive to the question, which is, are conservatives right to say that two-parent families are a good thing, whether or not, I mean, that's what, you know, prevailed uh, 50 or 100 years ago. It's possible that the 1950s were, as David Frum and others have argued, a very peculiar moment in American history. History. That doesn't mean that actually our institutions, you know, should not try to learn from previous waves of institutional innovation. So I think that, you know, that partly informs the historical sense of the book. Um, and also another thing we pay a lot of attention to uh, are the parallels between the Nixon era and the Bush era, uh, an era in which, you know, you had Nixon who was very shrewd politically, but then, you know, on the substantive level was simply not willing to make some of the kind of grand strategic moves, some of which were pretty expensive. He did make some grand strategic moves that were cheap and that were also extremely divisive in order to build a, a kind of winning political coalition. And I think that there are a lot of similarities to the Bush era. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think that the book is pretty different from a lot of, you know, kind of partisan polemics. I think that, you know, we do our best to be uh, fair. We do our best to actually challenge conservatives as well as liberals. Um, but, you know, it is very nerve-wracking putting something like this into the world because, of course, you know, it's going to be far from flawless by its very nature. And also, you know, some of the kind of nuances and subtleties of the way that you and I both think uh, are going to be elided. Um, and, and, and frankly, you know, the debate continues to move on. Things continue to change. And, and I think that the book makes a lot of valuable contributions. And, you know, I confidently stand behind it. But, you know, I, I wonder if people are going to make the right criticisms of the book. You know what I mean? If well, so, well really so that's a good question. So let's, you know, in, in our capacity of reviewing our own book, yeah. what, so what are the right criticisms of our book? Let's suppose you're a smart, well, let's suppose you're a smart liberal reviewer out, out to attack our arguments. Where, where would you begin? I think that probably the place to begin would be from, um, I'd say, a socially liberal perspective uh, I, I'm particularly thinking of a certain strain of feminism as represented by Linda Hirschman. I think that, you know, one of the big focuses of our book and something that, you know, I think that you and I are both particularly exercised by is this idea that there is only one appropriate model of how to be a working adult. Um, you know, I know that my own mother, for example, she was in and out of the workforce. I mean, she worked continuously through most of my, you know, childhood. I was a, a latchkey kid and had a really wonderful upbringing in my view. Uh, but at the same time, when my sisters were very young, she took a lot of time out to, and and I think that you know she then had to get back on a career trajectory. And you know, my mother was someone who had a lot of ambitions and a lot of opportunities very early on, and a lot of those opportunities weren't there for her when she got older and when she uh, settled in this country. And so I, I'm very sensitive to that, very sensitive to the idea that you know people who take time out of the workforce um, as mothers or as fathers, um, you know, often can't get the kind of further education that they need uh, to fulfill their ambitions and also, you know, to kind of make the kind of economic contribution that um, second earners, you know, need to make or, or perhaps primary earners. Um, so right, but so that's, that's right, but yeah. so that's where, yeah, I think I think the obvious... That's where we're coming Hirschman from. Again, I, I can imagine uh, Linda Hirschman saying, you know what, I mean, this is a veiled way to valorize uh, stay-at-home parents and to, uh, you know, punish those who want to have a continuous experience in the workforce. Yeah, and I think that that you know it, it would dovetail with a, with with a, with a broader critique. I think which would be that you know we are we are essentially and and you get this criticism I think from from aspects of the of the right. You know the Wall Street Journal editorial page has made this criticism when proposals like ours have been floated before. This idea that you know you, we are talking about trying to put government policy on the side of um, of families, specifically two parent families, um, in in the same way. I mean I think. We make the argument. I think it's an accurate argument that you know conservatives have all have long championed the idea, for instance, that you know we should we should tax investment at a different rate than we should tax income, right? That you know these are the 
that investors are doing specific work that builds American society in a sense. And I think that we're arguing for applying that insight to parents, to the sort of the kind of investments that parents are making in America's future. But I think, you know, the the, the obvious criticism is you're essentially, you know, oh, you're you're punishing single people. Um, you're essentially trying to create a, you know, a, a, a sort of struggle for resources between the married and the unmarried. And I think Andrew Sullivan, our, our colleague at The Atlantic, has made some criticisms along these lines. Yeah, I think that, you know, part of politics is going to be, you know, polarized. It's just, you know, the nature of political competition. And the question is, along which axes will it be polarized? And I think that's a a really deep structural question regarding, for example, the alliance on the right of center between libertarians and traditionalists. Now, I actually personally think of myself as being very sympathetic to a lot of libertarian notions, um, you know, which is, you know, why it's interesting to me. And I imagine a lot of the harshest criticism of our project uh, will come as it has come in the past from thoughtful libertarians who see it as you know, incipiently authoritarian. And I think that's wrong because I think that, in fact, what we're trying to do is actually create institutions, create a framework in which you know, we can defend an open economy. But I think that you know, uh, the, the Daniel Bell notion that uh, an open uh, market-oriented economy is parasitic on you know, traditional virtues that you know, were built up during a long pre-capitalist period... Uh, I think that's a little, you know, that's a crude characterization of his view, and I don't think it's exactly right, but I mean, the idea that there are sinews of civil society that can, in fact, be undermined by government policies, and the idea that to counteract that effect, you know, you can't just get out of the way. For example, you know, when, uh, I mean, this is a rather overdramatic example, but in the aftermath of the invasion of Iraq, you know, there's the Rumsfeldian stuff happens notion. Okay, you, you know, of course there's going to be rooting and, li- uh, you know, and uh, uh, looting and rioting, I should say. Uh, well, you know, I think that, you know, given the effects that, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, the criminal justice system have had on inner city neighborhoods, the idea that, okay, we'll, we'll just retreat. I mean, I think that that, you know, would be good, but you need to frame policies. I mean, given how pervasive the influence of, um, you know, the the social services state is in the contemporary United States and in all the advanced market democracies, you know, part of the question is how do you frame policies to bias them toward freedom and to bias them towards, you know, the well-being of the most vulnerable members of society as well as, you know, the middle class, uh, the bulwark of our democracy, uh, to sound very civic-y. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's interesting to me too because I think that uh, I think you're absolutely right that we're, our our arguments are going to take some of the strongest fire from from libertarian conservatives. I actually, you know, I mean, I think one of the interesting things when you embark on a project like writing the book is obviously your views change over time um, while you're writing and researching and so on. I think that I've become actually much more friendly to libertarian insights about the American economy through the process of working on this book. I think that, you know, when when we started on this project, I mean, I, I think we were, you know, we wanted to look at some of the issues that really only liberals had been talking about, right? Issues like economic inequality and its effect yeah. on American life, issues like either stagnating or declining economic mobility and so Certainly on. And the I idea think, of economic insecurity, which was very much au courant when we started out on the project. Right, and I know, and I mean, I think when we started out, for instance, um, um, I'm not sure if we quoted him in the original article that the book is based on or in a later article, but... Um, you know, Jacob Hacker and, and his book, The Great Risk Shift, um, this idea that, you know, economic economic prosperity was still growing, but economic insecurity had increased dramatically in American life over the last 30 years. And I think just because very few people on the right were talking about these issues, when we started on this project and started looking into this, I think I had, you know, I, I, I had a greater sympathy for... Um, the sort of left-wing viewpoint than I do now after spending sort of a year and a half steeping myself and ourselves in, in, in this material. I think, for instance, that, you know, a lot of the evidence that Hacker marshaled to argue that economic insecurity has, has uh, increased in the United States over the last 30 years turned out to be pretty hollow. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of arguments that smart libertarians make about the extent to which, for instance, working-class Americans even though their wages have stagnated over the past 30 years, nonetheless really have benefited from the, you know, the kind of economic expansion and, you know, really benefited from free trade, from a greater diversity of goods, from lower prices and so on. I think those arguments have come home to me much more through the process of writing the book. Yeah, I think the consumption inequality picture is very interesting, and I also think when you look at trends in leisure, et cetera, I think that, uh, 
yeah, I mean, we also just have, you know, people asking uh, better questions to some extent and doing better empirical work. So definitely that landscape has changed. Um, the consumption inequality issue is, is, is one of particular interest to me that I hope to pursue further. Well, why, why don't you that explain that a little more what, to, to our viewers? So what is, what is consumption, consumption inequality? Consumption inequality is just the idea of the basket of goods that you're consuming, um, you know, and how that reflects on your quality of life. And I think that, look, it's not a flawless indicator. I think that there are a lot of problems with it. But, you know, basically this idea, um, you know, some derisively refer to this as refrigerator poverty. That is, you know, the poor have awesome refrigerators, ergo we don't need to work. And, and again, there are strong criticisms of that. Lane Kenworthy, for example, has, you know, uh, talked recently in the, his blog about this idea that um, when you're looking, well, what you're really looking at is capability. That's why income matters. It gives you a full spectrum of capabilities for what to do, uh, you know, with your money that can include things that actually further build and enhance your wealth as opposed to, you know, buying awesome consumer non-durable goods manufactured in China, which don't necessarily, you know, enhance your future economic prospects. Um, there are a lot of thorny issues, but I think that, you know, as to, you know, the changing landscape, I mean, one thing that I often think about is the way that your peer group shapes your worldview and the way that it might push you in one direction or another. And, you know, I, I'm very wary of that. And I know that, you know, because our peer group and a lot of our friends are very intelligent, articulate people on the political right of center, you know, that obviously is going to shape how we think about stuff. And I think that we're both lucky in that we also have a lot of friends who are on the other side of the aisle, so to speak, who can provide continuous pressure on the things that we... But in fact, I'm often struck by the people who more or less, you know, talk to us and we talk to them who actually despise each other with a virulent passion. And I wonder how long that can last. Uh, and I'm actually, like, mildly fearful about the fact that, you know, putting this book into the world, suddenly, uh, you know, we will have many people's knives at our throats and, you know, we'll... Well, I mean, I think, you know, if, the, if, if that'll be a good thing, though. If the book's a success, people's knives will be at our throats. If they're, that, <laughs> if they're not, people will continue to like us. Um, but, yeah, I, no, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I want to, though, drill in on the point about inequality, because I think yeah. that this is this is it's one of the big issues we try and tackle in the book. It's something that I think conservatives haven't talked about very much. It's I think it's a pretty big issue in American life right now, and it's you know a very big issue um, for for writers and thinkers on the left. And I think that you know I, there's sort of a, a, an overarching question for conservatives, which is: Is economic inequality something that the right should be concerned about? Um, and I think a lot of conservatives would say that no, it isn't, as long as um, you know, as as long as the inequality isn't isn't um, related to immiseration, basically, yeah. as long as the poor are still getting richer, as long as the working class is still doing doing better. See, Ross, I'm know. trying to be meta, and you're trying to drill down. So I will play along, but I get very nervous. <laughs> you know, actually, the M, my middle initial, actually stands for meta. This is a little known fact. So did you want you want to drill you want to drill down? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I think that when you're Looking at the inequality, I mean, first of all, like, I'll just lay out my bias right now. I mean, I'm a firm believer that wage dispersion isn't necessarily ba a bad thing. There's a wonderful discussion right now at TPM Cafe of Clay Shirky's new book, Here Comes Everybody, which, as Ross pointed out to me, is a term that's been used to refer to the Catholic Church. Um, and it's wonderful because, you know, Julian Sanchez and Tim Lee are wrestling back and forth with Clay Shirky, who is a really brilliant thinker about uh, a network society, about the uh, revolution and communications technology and how it's shaping how we think and how we live, uh, and also how we form organizations. Most importantly, that's his central concern. And, you know, kind of one of his great insights is about power laws, about when you look at the blogosphere, for example, and the size of the audience for the highest traffic blogs, and then at the other hand, you have all of these live journal blogs that are basically for the consumption of an individual or of an individual in, you know, her immediate circle or his immediate circle. And I think that, you know, you see a similar pattern in inequality. For example, you know, a lot of, um, you know, our lefty friends look to you Europe, they look to pre-tax inequality levels in Europe and say, look, they have different institutions, they have greater union density, this is a good thing, and it's healthier for society more broadly. What I say is, well, when you look at actually the skill distribution in Europe, they're now catching up with the United States in terms of rates of uh, tertiary education completion, uh, the number of people with undergraduate degrees, but they're still, so in the in this cohort, they actually might, some European countries might actually exceed us in the number of people who complete a uh, college degree, but actually the skill distribution overall isn't where we are. So given the fact that age and education 
inflation uh, tend to lead to greater wage dispersion. You know, clearly the Europeans actually are going through a related process, and we are likely to see increases in inequality there. So the argument made by a lot of people at the Economic Policy Institute, places like that, a lot of economic populists, that you know inequality is fundamentally about um, the Republicans, uh, rapaciousness, etc. You know, that's what drives it. I think that you know that's not crazy. Clearly. I wouldn't say rapaciousness, but clearly a shift in uh, the marginal uh, tax rate, you know, this kind of thing, I mean, has lasting effects, the way that we treat wealth, uh, the way that we treat entrepreneurship. But, I mean, I think that there are big structural questions, which is why I'm so skeptical about the idea that, you know, you look to models in Denmark, you look to models in other societies that are radically different from our own. What I think that we need to do is actually pioneer new social models in the United States. I think that's what we're best at. That, you know, yeah, do draw on certain insights that we've gathered from, you know, Sweden. But again, I mean, one of my favorite facts, uh, and we talk about this in the book, is that, you know, in Sweden, family structure is very Aussie and Harriet. Despite the fact that people aren't always married, the number of disrupted families is radically lower in Sweden, France, and in Germany than the United States. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? when you're looking at the child poverty picture. You know what I mean? Uh, I think that, you know, we actually use, you know, non-marital, you know, uh, childbearing. You know, but that's a kind of misleading number. What you really need to look at is disrupted families. And I think that actually Europe is way ahead of us in terms of achieving a lot of the goals that, you know, American conservatives um, care about the most. So, you know, inequality, you know, uh, it's important, but I actually take the Confucian view, which is that the inequality that matters is in the uh, inequality and in nurturing relationships that people have in their lives. I realize that sounds very kind of wimpy. No, I mean, I think, well, this is, you know, we talk we talk a lot in the book about, about you know, the idea that, yeah, the, 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 the sort of, I mean, and th- that this is actually a driver of wealth dispersion and economic inequality is inequality of um, you know, inequality of marriage rates, inequality of intact families, the fact that, you know, if you look if, if you look at the 1950s, marriage rates were more or less constant across the social classes. Today, people in the upper middle class and the upper class are still behaving like 1950s bourgeois married couples. Right. As though the, that stigma still existed in a powerful way. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and the, the, you know, that this is a big driver. I mean, I think the other thing that I'd say um, is that, I, I mean, in my view, the reason the reasons that conservatives should care about inequality are not inherent to inequality. They have to do with ideas of you know social and economic mobility on the one hand, and the sort of underlying sense of legitimacy of the American political order on the other hand. That in the sense, and this is something David Frum talks a bit about um, in in his book Comeback, and we, we I think we take up similar points. The idea that you know to, to to the extent you want people to perceive um, and you want America to actually be a place where, you know, people are always going to do well in America, but you want it to be a place where people perceive that they can effectively change their life station if they want to, or that their children can change their life station. And I think that, you know, one of the problems with the, the, that, that we have today is a problem of, you know, you have sort of the hardening of the meritocratic arteries where, you know, as it, where elite colleges and universities and just colleges and universities per se, those graduates tend to pass on the, um, the kind of habits and mores that lead their kids to get into those colleges and so on. And at the same time, you have um, you know, family breakdown, family dissolution and so on in the, in the working and, uh, and, and lower classes. This combination has the potential to, you know, it, it'll st- America will still be a rich country and it'll still be a country where, you know, the working class isn't being pushed into poverty, but they won't have the same sense, I think, that people in America have traditionally had that, you know, you work hard, you play by the rules, your kids can have a meaningfully different life than you yeah. do. One thing, Ross, that occurred to me, um, we only have another 10 minutes or so, uh, and it occurred to me that, you know, we're trying to be very honest and forthright, um, yet I don't know if we're aggressively selling the book enough. So I was just thinking, I'm going to hold it up now to the camera. Uh, I'll, I'll, book, I'll do the same. Oh, my God. This book, it's just its just magical. I mean, honestly, I you know, I, I forgot that, a, you, know, uh, you know, my friend and I had written it the other night, and I was thumbing through it, and I was, like, thinking, why am I getting so excited suddenly? What What's, what's going on? Like, I, I feel a strange uh, tingle of delight. That's and it's, I was thinking, you know, you know, people watch television. They watch, uh, they watch the reality TV. They play, uh, the, you know, the Grand Theft Auto uh, Twelve. Uh, you know, in which you actually can fondle and, and, and knife people in, in the belly. Um, and actually, a real person, you know, in in my neighborhood will actually die. Um, it's very sad. But I mean, this is something no one gets hurt. 
You know what I mean? We're not glorifying violence by any means. This is very child appropriate. The book is absolutely, I'd say PG thirteen. I don't know how you you're, you know you're a movie critic. So I mean, we do we do talk a lot about sex in the book. We do we do in childbearing, but we talk about it. You know, we, we talk it as, uh, about it as stern taskmasters, and it's well, and, and childbearing is ultimately. I mean, they showed us like those Miracle of Life videos when we were in fifth grade. So I mean, I think that that has to be a PG. This is uh, I, this is just. It's so, it's so, it's zany when you want it to be zany, but it's like a choose-your-own-adventure book, because if you want it to be very sober and serious, you want it to be a compendium of just fascinating facts, uh, it'll be that too. I mean, you know, it's, it's also just the color scheme is arresting, it will look great on any coffee table. Uh, it, Ross, and, it, uh, tell me. No, no, and I, and I feel compelled to note that the, the elephant, the elephant here, so that it's very yeah. small, viewers may not be able to see it, but so there's an elephant on, on the front of the book, and um, the elephant is wearing a hat. And in the initial initial design of, of, of the book, the elephant was not wearing a hat. Um, and I think that the addition of the hat is, uh, because he's an elephant, I, you know, he's at a party. He's yeah. wearing a hat. Well, you know, I also just... I mean, if you're to, looking for, like, yeah. one, you know, just one, one, one reason to buy the book, <laughs> buy for the elephant's hat. Who doesn't love an elephant wearing a hat? Who doesn't love serious? an elephant wearing a hat? Well, all right, but no, we, all, we do only have ten minutes left, so we should okay, get back yeah, to substance, yeah, course, right? We can't, we can't get carried away by, yeah, yeah, by yeah. the wonders of our book. So, so, here's, so I, I talked awesome a little title. bit about something I, I changed my mind on in the book, yeah. actually moving a little bit to the right on, on economics in the course of writing it. Now, I, I mean, I think people may not have a sense of this, but it takes a long time for a book to come out. We've more or less finished writing this book, you know, nine months to a year ago. And so, yeah. you know, there's plenty of time for, for lots of things to happen and for people to change their minds. So is there, is there anything in the book that, well, we'll put it this way, is there anything in the book that we, that we wrote that you feel more skeptical about today? Uh, yeah, there's a little passage where uh, I talk, uh, you know, sort of, a, you know, we both talked about, I mean, we both, you know, I don't know, CEO pay, I think that we were much friendlier to the big boom and CEO compensation than I am right now. Um, and I, I was actually just rereading uh, a book that I, I didn't really give adequate attention to. Um, you know, and I saw it years ago. In fact, so many years you know ago that I actually didn't really remember it while working on uh, you know Grand New Party. And I think that you know, kind of, uh, we've talked about this a little bit. This guy Rakesh Kurana, um, who wrote a wonderful book about CEO compensation, about the search for charismatic leaders, and it was just about the dysfunctions of the CEO marketplace. And it's interesting because he actually uh, counterposes himself against, for example, uh, Robert Frank and others who talk about the idea of a winner take all society. Because this is actually a picture that you know says that you know even when the economy is working brilliantly well. You have these stories of people being, you know, incredibly well compensated because of, you know, the way that the economy has come to resemble a superstar tournament. And Kurana is saying that actually the market is very, very dysfunctional. It's not working in, in a kind of rational, logical way at all because it's so, um, you know, susceptible to finding these charismatic figures who can move the stock price over a very short period of time. I mean, this is, you know, kind of like a fairly minor um, academic-y note, but I do think that it, it's an important... Yeah, but it thing. is one of the issues. I mean, people fixate on CEO pay, I think. They fixate on CEO pay, which I think is a mistake, but at the same time, I think that... But so you think you think we were too soft on skyrocketing CEO pay? It's not that I think we were too soft on it. It's that I think that, you know, we were unsubtle about it and unnuanced about it in a way that's a shame because I think that I believe that the government should not be involved uh, in CEO pay per se but I do think that the argument that people make about the dysfunction of corporate bureaucracies is an important one. I think that you know, as conservatives, I think that we have some obligation to say that, you know, look, here are institutions, and as thinkers you know, here are institutions that in civil society are dysfunctional. And you know, obviously that wasn't our core concern. We were talking about the state. We are talking about the welfare state. Um, but I think that it's something to you know, keep in mind because, you know, obviously, you know, it's not that, you know, these dysfunctions only exist in government. In parallel, you know, institutions in the private sector, they exist too, and, you know, they're they're worthy of criticism. Um, I think immigration is one area where you and I, there's some, you know... Yeah, I mean, so in, in just as, as background, in the book, we basically argue for for the Republican Party to take what I would term a moderate restrictionist point of view on immigration, which is to say one that emphasizes border security first, that emphasizes reducing the rate of illegal immigration to the U.S., yeah. um, and then in the long run, you know, contemplating perhaps, a, you know, perhaps some form of amnesty. I think you, Raihan, are more, I don't want to say to my left on the subject, but you're, you're more sympathetic generally to 
open immigration. Would, would you say that's fair? Yeah, you know, I think that I've been literally all over the map on this issue. I remember I, I, at some point I remember being a very strong restrictionist, uh, and I remember being really laissez-faire about it. My current view, um, and you know, I remember I reading a New York Times op-ed some years ago uh, by the Mexican foreign minister, obviously a voice that you know um, American conservatives pay very close attention to in terms of how they're going to frame their immigration policies. But it was talking about you know deepening North American integration, and, and while I think that idea, you know, it's commonly associated with the left, I think there's an idea that would be palatable to the right, namely, you know, Mexico should be accountable for the number of illegal entrants into the United States. At the same time, a big source of the push factors in Mexico are their lack of, you know, broad policy space in terms of their agricultural policies. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, credit markets that don't work very well. Uh, I think an infrastructure that is very weak. A lot of things, you know, that I think that, you know, American capital, uh, you know, could do a lot to help. Now, you know, should this be directed by the government? I think that when you're looking at preferential trade agreements, which, you know, we call free trade agreements, uh, alternatives to multilateral free trade, like the Doha round, instead negotiating with a particular country like, you know, CAFTA, NAFTA, uh, the free trade deal with South Korea, etc. I think that the problem with these things is that they might end up undermining the multilateral trade order and that they involve all kinds of, you know, silly side deals, that kind of thing, that actually undermine the broader goal of free trade. At the same time, the case for them is that they sometimes have a broad strategic benefit. And I think that a relationship with Mexico is one where, you know, boy, this is the key strategic question. Are we going to have uh, a peaceful, collaborative, constructive relationship with this massive country that is along our southern border? And, you know, are we going to have a relationship? We clearly are better off that that country becomes prosperous. That was part of the rhetoric around NAFTA when it was passed during the Clinton administration. The trouble is that, you know, all of the things that Mexico needs to be, I mean, it, it, it's not just, you know, okay, well, here's, you know, free trade, sort of, you know, when actually it had a much bigger impact on them and they didn't actually have the cushion, they didn't have the policy space because we negotiated them into a corner. So when people like, you know, Barack Obama talk about how let's renegotiate NAFTA, I think, you know, gee, yeah, let's renegotiate it, but it's not obvious that we're going to renegotiate in the way that you want us to because actually the Mex, you know, Mexico and, and Canada, they actually got kind of a bum deal and the ways that we got a bum deal, I mean, require a more intelligent, broader, more comprehensive conversation conversation about migration and about uh, and, and, and about policy space yes well right and you I mean this is it's a, the argument you've just made I would say is a very technocratic argument and I think that you yeah. know the, the, the focus the focus <laughs> of the book well no I mean I know I, yeah, no, I, it's, it's totally true it's totally, it's totally true. true and I mean I think the focus of the book and it is is much more on you know I mean we are we are arguing about you know real problems in American society we're also yeah. trying to frame a domestic policy narrative that focuses around um, sort of, you know, a, a working class conservatism broadly understood. And I think that yeah. there, you know, and I, I think if you look at an issue like immigration, you know, you aren't going to frame, you know, you, you're, you're going to frame that debate one way or another around issues having to do with border security, assimilation, um, you know, and, and you know, workplace issues and, you know, hiring and firing and, um, illegal aliens. And I think Absolutely. that, you know, there's sort of a second order. And, and But this gets into what I think is, you know, we, we now only have four minutes left. But <laughs> what I think is, you know, there's a sort of broader criticism of our book, which is that, um, you know, it we're doesn't talk about types. foreign policy. Yeah. Oh, well, that too, yeah. Well, but I mean, what you're talking about essentially is, you know, it's an immigration strategy, but it's ultimately a strategy that relates to our foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Mexico, rather Absolutely. than, you know, what we decide to do in terms of how many border patrol agents we have, or, you know, what kind of, um, you know, what kind of sanctions we have on employers yeah. who hire illegal aliens. And, totally, totally. and I think, you know, I think that, um, I think that, well, uh, on the one hand, I'm kind of defensive on this point. I think that, you know, it, there, particularly since I think there hasn't been a lot of really fresh conservative domestic policy thinking, and there really hadn't been, I think, when we started working on this book, I think yeah. there's real value in writing a book that is just focused on domestic policy issues and sort of brackets the foreign policy debates. That being said, I think both as a matter of sort of political strategy for the GOP going forward and as a matter of policy for exactly the reasons you just laid out, um, talking talking about our, our our trade relationship with Mexico, you know, you can't totally disentangle domestic policy from foreign policy. 
totally. And that's increasingly true. One one quick thing. I mean, I think that on foreign policy, another issue is that I think that you and I, on the big ticket issues of the day, you know, oftentimes agree. But I think it's another area where, you know, we come from very different places, sometimes reach similar conclusions. But certainly on foreign policy, I think of you as being in the camp of a foreign policy traditionalist, a realist, uh, you know, kind of very much in the kind of sober-minded tradition of Republican statesmanship. I think of myself as, you know, actually being sympathetic to a lot of uh, sort of neoconservative conclusions at the moment about, you know, uh, how good a job Robert Gates and David Petraeus, et cetera, have done in Iraq, et cetera. But I think that actually my, my views about foreign policy are actually really radical and bizarre, so that actually trying to write about them here would, you know, make it sound like a science fiction book. Well, uh, well I mean, yeah, I, I think... Uh, yeah, it's part of it is it, it's tough for me to tell where we agree and where we disagree on foreign policy, partially <laughs> because yeah, your views are somewhat you know bizarre sometimes, but also also I I really have a tough time figuring out what my views are, and I think you know I find myself when I blog on the subject, I I think I find myself sort of critiquing other people's foreign policy systems much more than I do advancing sort of any any sort of systematic approach. Um, of my own, and I think that that's that's a weakness. I I just have a tough time. Uh, some of this, I think, is just I feel like you know Iraq is such a defining foreign policy challenge for the United States yeah. at the moment. I think we've reached a point in Iraq where to say anything really meaningful and interesting, analytical about the situation, you really have to be steeped at the facts on the ground to in a way that that I'm certainly not. I think you are more more so than I am. But, but because yeah, I mean, of that, it's, I think it's, it's, it's tough very hard to f- for either of us. I think that, you know, kind of I certainly don't feel as confident as I'd like to on the subject, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well you know, all right. Well, so so we've well, we've basically reached well, just, reached the end of our allotted of time. I know, um, I'm not sure whether this sort of scattered conversation will encourage anyone to buy <laughs> our uh, very fine, very fine book. But if it if it does, it's available in, on Amazon and at bookstores near you. And um, maybe Ryan and I will return in six months and uh, talk again about um, something that we didn't collaborate on, right? <laughs> Uh, and I just uh, want to thank Blog Enhance, but I also just want to say that you know Ross and I are, are really good friends. It was such a pleasure to work on this, and I really hope that we get to meet you guys uh, at some point. You know, perhaps at a reading or something like that. And uh, are you you're, you're addressing the Blogging Heads audience? Yes, I am. You're breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> yeah. Oh, whoops! I forgot about that. Oh man, I I, I, I guess now I'm going to fall into a vortex of some kind. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, as we both fall into a vortex, thanks for chatting with me, Raihan. I'll see you down the hall in our office. Thank you, Russ. Bye. Bye.